We are delighted to introduce our next panel speakers, Thomas Stiglitz. Thomas is joining us and speaking via Zoom. As many of you know, he, he has been a uh, neurotechnologist, neural engineer, and also entrepreneur. And he built two companies and he played key role for the uh, in the areas of especially the neural implants, and his talk is going to be today macro implants and in translational research. We are delighted to have you, Thomas. Yeah, Metin, thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. And if you could give me a thumb if my voice is loud enough and if you see the title slide. Um, I always I'm... hear you. Your voice is always fantastic. And the slides are also good. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, I I want to take you on, on a journey um, over the next 20 minutes on those neural micro implants and the idea how you how you can come from from whatever idea you have to clinical trials and product. And I stole this product here from the Cortec web page. Um, the idea came up in, in Martin Schüttler's mind and Greg Swanning and some others about 2005 and the first 510k approval in the US came up in, in, in 2021 or 2022. That means they're about 15, 16 years um, in between, which is quite a long way. And, and this is something where materials with a medical device history like platinum iridium, stainless steel, and uh, PDMS, so silicone rubber, has been taken. And the question is, um, <clears throat> could that also work um, with other materials? So if we go towards micro and nanotechnology, can we do something? Can we bring our ideas into clinical practice? And if we do so, what can we learn from that? So are they always good? What is about the question, do they stay for weeks or months or even longer? Is there longevity or should we skip everything new and go back to the old style materials if we want to be safe in clinical products? And we set up a laboratory um, to, to, that helps us due to accredited processes and a quality management system to go through all those steps finally into humans in a way that I still can sleep well. Um, so the technology comes from micromachining and um, we are working on polyimid as flexible material to make it in very different shapes and put it um, on nerves, into nerves, on the brain. And the question is, is it good what we are doing? And I mean, if I do such a talk, I would, would be uh, probably praising all that stuff. Um, but I'd like to, to show you some aspects that we investigated over the last 15 years to, to really understand what's going on with those probes and what does that mean if we want to have something reliable um, for months and hopefully for years on that. And there are two examples, and one example will focus on those ECOG arrays uh, for the central nervous system, and another one is the time electrode, an intrafascicular electrode that goes into peripheral nerve. And <clears throat> before doing so, I want to share some thoughts about translational research, um, which is important if we look later on the results and question, why did we do that? Um, and I mean, if we, we, we are sitting together, and I would love to sit with you over a beer later on of the day in San Diego over that. Um, and, and we recognize that, that say, a clinical um, neurologist, an engineer, and a, a preclinical neuroscientist are sitting together. They have probably different driving forces in their research. So is it the therapy on the patient? Is it a new tool? Um, is it a new paper in nature that we have? Um, and I think we have to speak that out to find out um, how to work together and how to make the best and the best synergy um, of our ideas. And if we go to model systems, I mean, we, we know everything uh, from the fruit, fruit fly up to non-human primates and, and humans, but the question is what results can we really transfer from one model system to the other and where are limitations? And these questions 
should be done in translational research if my aim would be to go into human clinical trial very early on to select the right model systems and find out what can I use in that model system and what um, do I have to, to, to investigate in another one. And last not least, the reproducibility. If we do, let's say, fundamental research, we are happy with an n equal to five that suffices our statistical needs. However, if we go into series manufacturing, and series manufacturing could mean we like to implant five patients, um, then we have to start with series of 100, 150, 200, and even more devices due to all the uh, safety validations that we have to do in advance. And that is something completely different with respect to the infrastructure and all the processes we have in the background. And last not least, if, if it comes to company, um, we should uh, take a long timeline and an incredible large bag of money that we need to come from the first proof of concept studies in, in mice or rats um, towards humans. And if we do so, um, <clears throat> we have to take a close look on the stability and reliability requirements. And as, as one of the success stories here, a cochlear implant, for example, it's not only the, when we ask the question, um, is it stable, is it reliable? We have to take different aspects into account. It's not only the material that we have to check. So for electrodes, materials for insulation and packages, but also the question, how do we manufacture that? What about the cables, the plugs, the connectors? Let's say the more boring, the less exciting stuff that is key for reliability in those complex implants. Um, not to speak about foreign body reactions, humidity ions, um, which is kind of our core business there. But beyond that, we should uh, communicate and make training sessions very early on uh, with surgeons and also with potential users to prevent uh, kind of stupid failures due to handling procedures or to wrong expectations that users have. And I'll show you one example where we had as, as research group uh, wrong expectations, how people will behave with the implants. So and that all comes together and paints that big picture of stability and reliability. I want to share some, let's say, success stories and failure modes with respect to sensory feedback. Um, in nerve electrodes, the times, those intrafascicular electrodes made out of polyimid foils that have been implanted in three patients up to four months in upper limbs and uh, in lower limbs and up to, to three patients up to six months in upper limbs. And results were good. This is not the topic of today, but the question is how stable was that at the very end? And this is where the time electrode here on the left-hand side comes into the game and where I like to comment on some aspects. And later on in this talk, I like to comment on the stability of ECOG arrays, where we have those uh, foils on the brain. This is mainly the picture you see when you see results from neuroscientists. As engineer, I'm as excited as about the neural signals on the stability of the connectors which are a boring but very important interface part to get reliable separation of different channels and stable signals over months. So let's start um, with a time electrode. They got implanted in patients and they had to be explanted afterwards. And of course, that's the duty of the surgeon. The surgeon took care of the patient's nerve and not of our electrodes, but we wanted to investigate them afterwards. And what we got were bits and pieces and not the complete electrode. And we did some investigations with light microscopy, did some simulations to find out if, if theory and practice might fit together, uh, went to scanning electron microscopy and also to to computer tomography investigations on the cables. And if you look on the left-hand side, you see different parts here, the cables as such, the transition to connectors and the front part that went into the brain. And the question is, what happens there? And we made our mind um, and 
think we have to consider different aspects if you go from pristine electrode contacts before implantation to what you get out after explantation. There has been furry body reaction, probably tissue um, adhered to the electrode. You pull it into a direction which is not intended to get pulled um, in the work in the intended use. Um, and you have movements due to the movement of the patient's arms and probably due to the patient's handling uh, with your devices or the rehab uh, personnel handling there. And the question is, what did we find out? And I'd like to share that with you. Um, so we did a kind of Kaplan-Meyer plot about electrodes in uh, the patients, three different patients you see in, in blue and in gray, a line that is not that promising after 10 weeks. And this is shifted by one week because two patients got implanted with a, diff, with a time span of one week in between. And you can imagine on week 11, we got a phone call from our colleagues in that European project said, hey, come on, half of your contacts already broke. I said, oh, that's, uh, that's bad. Um, can you tell us well, what you did with those electrodes to give any hint? I said, you know, um, the patient handled that twice a day for connection and, and uh, deconnection. And then I say, you, you know, uh, you need two hands uh, for doing that. And we are talking here about uh, upper limb prosthesis where I believe that the patient has only one hand. Um, and it came out uh, that they did not re read the Muses manual. And so they pulled on the cable instead of uh, using the connector and therefore the connector broke. Um, and we could fix that for the third patient, which is the red one. And we ended up with about 80 contact points mm -hmm. after more than 20 weeks that worked. And we said, oh, that's good. Let's analyze how they look like. And when we got that out, we were a little bit upset because we saw a lot of mess there. And it turned out after a serious interrogation of everybody um, that many of those failures might be associated due to the explantation procedure. If you take surgical tweezers, if you try to pull that out of the nerve tissue, then you might break through uh, your device. And we found out that a lot of those electrodes, category one and two, were still well working, which was in accordance with those 80% perception rate after 22 uh, weeks. And this is something uh, which I, I believe is very important to get the idea, how can we do condition monitoring of the electrodes? Do we know how they work um, and how the failure modes are? We, we've seen some indications um, that there might be stress cracking on the electrodes, uh, but we still have to work on that in further studies really to find out what the body does with the implants since they stayed stable for for similar conditions um, in vitro up to 5 billion pulses. Um, the cable issue that we had was really at the transition of the connector and the cable, um, which should be used with two hands, the connector in one hand and the counterpart in the other hand. If you pull and push on the cable, you get breakage as shown in the upper row here. On the transition part, there's no white spot and any white spot would, um, would indicate a cable. If you don't see any white spot, there's no cable left here in the transition. Um, we, we corrected that stupid design in a more stable one and found out after more than 20 weeks that all the cables here are still intact and that you really need strong mechanical handling there. That was, was a real surprise for us because we thought the thin film is the weak point and found out later on it's the connector part. Um, same or similar with ECOG arrays, which have been implanted in Pascal Fries lab in Frankfurt uh, for more than 17 months. And we had a dropout rate of less than 10% over those 17 months. But we found out that the dropout channels uh, means they were still recording data, but they had all the identical signals on all those channels, channels which could not work if you have a good spread over a certain area on the brain. 
and found out is it's just one line of an omnetics connector. And if you know those con omnetics connectors and handling them, it takes quite some force to connect them and deconnect them. And while wiggling around with them, um, the connection underfill got a little bit loose and water ingress came up and short circuited all the adjacent contacts. And this is current one of the research topics we are working on to get that solved that you have with those implants in chronicle non-human primate studies, um, even signals for longer than uh, 17 months. Uh, we had some, some success rates in another study at up to two and a half years. The second thing is about the flexibility. There's a lot of literature around about flexible stuff and depending what material you use, you claim that other material is not that flexible. And, and we thought since some person said, well, uh, polyimid doesn't work. And we thought, well, it works in our hands. Uh, what could be, could be wrong with other hands? Um, and we, we thought we should have a look on the thickness of that. How thick the material is, how wide it is, and get a kind of conformability measurement based on an adhesion theory model and um, based on the curvatures that we have in monkeys, um, in even in rabbits, we found out that we were on the lucky side. So we are working with a thickness between eight and 10 microns, which is perfectly fine for that curvature of the brain and does not um, give any indentation of the brain tissue. If you get thicker and you try to fix that on the brain, as you see on the very lower right-hand side, there is, um, there is a deformation of the brain that causes then uh, more severe um, changes and even destruction. If it's really conformable, um, we also found out, which is in accordance to many other studies, uh, but I think it should be spoken out if it's really conformable and really snugly um, adheres to the brain, you can record spike-like activity from the surface that is very comparable to intracortical spike recordings that you get with shank allergens. It would mean that you, in one or another case, you can probably just take surface electrodes without the need to go into the depth if you do not want to resolve that really on a single cell. That was done in ferret studies in um, Andreas Engel's group in Hamburg for up to two years. The question is, how do those arrays look like after two years? And this is uh, our current research where we get all those explants and we try to find out um, what failure modes are and how stability is. And to cut the long story short, uh, we have so far identified secondary uh, dura growth without an idea how it's really triggered. Um, we have seen in some spots calcification, um, hydrogen and brittle mint of platinum layers uh, due to the pH changes um, and the long um, exposure to water and we have to find out if this is uh, similar if you have coatings with silicon carbide and iridium oxide. This is the next uh, round we are currently investigating and we see delamination and cell growth um, but have to find out if this really um, impacts um, the functionality and if so how long that impacts functionality and third question is this already present in vivo or is this something that pops up um, when you explant the arrays and pull them out? So that means we're currently trying to investigate arrays and uh, tissues together in scanning electron microscopy. And I think I am more than happy if I can show you some results in two or three years from now. Um, the other question with respect to structural biocompatibility is how small should I go? And you can say, well, as a scientist, I should go as small as possible, but I'm, as an engineer would say, uh, my question is what is small enough? So what is small enough to be on the reliability, reliable side of size, but be uh, at the minimum of foreign body reaction, for example, and to cut that another long story short, um, the smaller, the better, yes, but if you have 30 microns width at eight microns thickness 
and 100 mi microns width of a shank electrode with eight microns thickness, then it turns out that the differences are relatively small. So even 100 micrometers is conformable enough for that, but that the major impact that you have are the tethering forces, how you connect those probes to your connectors on the skull. And this uh, changes the re reactivity much more than the width as such. And, and if you want to see more details, I, I like to, to point you to that biomaterials paper. We can even come close to generation one of, of neuropixels, of course, not with 1000, but with 32, which is not worse than Elon Musk's first publication on those things. Um, but we could show uh, that it really works and that it's stable up to half a year for multi-unit recordings. And we're currently uh, shaping a publication on that. And we believe if somebody wants to have something conformable for chronic implants, then it could be an alternative to active probes that are quite often more, uh, more rigid and might need more care with respect to the implantable electronics. Last not least, um, which electrode material should we use? That's quite often a serious question. And the answer, I guess, is, is not that easy, but it depends because it depends on the purpose and on the application. If you want to combine it um, with MR imaging and you do not want to have a lot of imaging artifacts, then carbon, graphitic carbon or glassy carbon, even graphene is a good candidate. P dot, all those conjugated polymers are good candidates um, for recording purposes, even at very small electrodes. Um, but if you're a bit larger, I would say it's, it's really a trade-off between technology stability, um, if you stick with iridium oxide or if you wanna take more fancy materials here. Scientifically, of course, it's always uh, exciting to go to new materials, but with respect to translational research, and bringing things into human um, is always a trade-off between uh, longevity and curiosity to investigate new material. And with that, I like to close for today and can conclude that understanding of many things helps a lot. So if we better understand the material tissue interface, we improve functionality and this understanding should guide also our material selection and not what we have on the shelf. Um, and I strongly believe if some groups, um, and I'm happy to, to um, go into that too, um, to investigate and understand failure modes much better and talk about negative results, we help to increase the longevity of the probes in the community um, very much. Um, as I could probably also show just a side effect um, translational research really needs endurance and long time scales, and it takes so many years from, from an original idea to clinical trials. Um, probably a warning to those who want to set up a company, not every exciting research result is a solid business case, so I think this would be the topic of another talk. Um, and we should also take care and, and learn from the past and also the recent past um, that, that we should have solid business cases to be able to support every patient that got implanted over all of their lifetime and don't leave them there just because of the economic reasons when companies are shut down. And with that, I'd like to close. Um, thank all my funding agencies and all my, my former and actual members of my group. Um, and I'm happy to answer some questions. And just in case somebody does not know where we are, this is here um, a short map. Um, you're all invited to come by, um, visit us. We have a beautiful new building for interdisciplinary research. And with that, I'm really at the end. Uh, stop my screen sharing and I'm happy to answer some questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so it's inspiring and it's inspiring for clear answers. Highly appreciate it. Any questions from audience? 
essence of the rush for this exciting uh, talk. I was wondering about the long term uh, assessment of uh, electrode. Uh, are you able to combine uh, um, in your in your study uh, chemical and mechanical uh, 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 fatigue? Uh, I mean, uh, depending on the uh, location of the electrode, I guess the the um, uh, behavior and uh, the effort on the electrode are quite different. So, how do you take that into account? Yeah, uh, I don't know if I fully agree with you. Um, you you're right. So, so all the stresses are different uh, depending on the implantation site. But nevertheless, we, we will have if something is in the brain or on the brain. We have relative movements, so we have shear forces. Um, and we have a foreign body reaction. And we have the same in the peripheral nervous system. And if we try to, to separate the direct um, influence on the interface and, and the, the primary scar there from the tethering forces and the cables, I would say the mechanisms in the foreign body reaction are similar. And so the question is that, that we currently address is um, how strong is the adhesion between thin film metal and substrate? Um, how good is the adhesion between um, upper and bottom layer of substrate or additional um, adhesion layers or encapsulation layers or, or hermeticity layers, if we would in, include uh, chips. Um, and does the material as such change? So, so do, you, do we see a change in, in grain boundary composition, um, um, grain boundary depletion, or um, something like that over the time course due to the exposure to hydrogen, um, to pH shifts and, and to salt ions. And I think this is quite comparable uh, in the brain and in the peripheral nervous system. And um, I guess that is also the weak point with respect to assembling technologies, cables and whatever, I completely agree with you. And we have to have a very specific look um, how, how this is this is handled. Do we talk about head fixed mounting or do, do we have percutaneous cables or something like that? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, very exciting talk. Um, uh, seeing the results in your time electrode, uh, are you moving away from intracellularly to cup electrodes? Uh, could you please repeat that? Um, got, got a little you, bit. You have, you have shown um, you have shown some um, time the time electrode intercept mm -hmm. in uh, uh, very fall nerve collecting. Um, are you are you uh, do you think it's it's better to move away of these intercellular electrodes through to uh, more uh, cough multi uh, electrodes in uh, or for peripheral nerve uh, stimulation? Uh, that, that, that's a tricky question. I mean, it depends on the application. There are probably applications, uh, scenarios where cuff electrodes are good, um, where you know that, that your target structures are, are, well, let's say mainly in superficial layers. Then I would say go for cuff electrodes and you can select every superficial part. Mm -hmm. um, of the nerve, that's fine. Um, if you know that you need to selectively address deep parts of the nerve, uh, I would definitely go with something that goes into the nerve. Um, and it depends where you are. I, I would probably not go with time electrodes into vagus nerve where, where I could mess up a lot of things. Mm -hmm. While let's say in a peripheral nerve of an amputee where you know that uh, well, we have found that that there is no additional damage, at least to our knowledge. Um, I would say this is probably, and and you are you are more you are clearer what you want to target there in the median nerve and the in in the other nerve. Then I would say it's it's worth trying that out. Um, we found with the time lecture, it's really um, a, a recruitment that that goes beyond the fascicular level. And this is probably something I would not expect with cuff electrodes. If, if I'm more on the modulation side, I, I would say cuff electrodes can do a great job. Okay, well, again, we 
thank you so much. This very insightful talk and uh, highly appreciated and great to see you, Thomas. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much and wish you a uh, pleasant stay. Great. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so I am Adil Akhtar. I'm the CEO and founder of Psionic, and we develop advanced bionic limbs that are affordable and accessible to uh, everyone. And usually when I give these talks, I like to start off with a video. And this was a uh, commercial that the University of Illinois made that they played during the halftime of football games. What did you do? Did you focus on a game? Hey, can I? What is that paper do? Can I tell you my idea? How can we make it cheaper? Do you think this will work? How does that feel? So if you couldn't tell that was me at the end of that video. Uh, but I really like this video because it highlights the journey of starting off as a young kid who's curious about the world all the way to building these bionic limbs that can be controlled neurally and with your muscles, et cetera, right? And so for me personally, the journey started when I was seven years old. My parents are from Pakistan and I was visiting there. And that's the first time I met someone with a limb difference. She was my age, missing her right leg and using a broken tree branch as a crutch. And that's what inspired me to want to go into the field. And so I ended up going to Loyola University of Chicago, got a bachelor's in biology, um, got a master's in computer science there. And I was looking for a way to combine my interest in engineering and, um, and uh, prosthetics in particular. And right down the street uh, in downtown Chicago uh, is the formerly known as the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, where Dr. Kaiken was at. They had just um, uh, invented the targeted reinnervation surgery. And it's now the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, as many of you know. And this is Amanda Kitts. She lost her left arm above her elbow due to a motorcycle accident. And she's controlling this arm um, just by using her, her residual muscles that have been rewired so that when she tries to bend her elbow or make a fist or make a pinch, um, different muscles that weren't uh, supposed to do those functions before are now activated. And you can use muscle sensors on uh, your the surface of your skin to then control these degrees of freedom that you wouldn't uh, typically have um, from a uh, typical amputation. And this was incredible, right? This was the perfect combination of like, like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, 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 computational neuroscience, physical medicine, rehab. And it's exactly what I wanted to do. Um, now, one of the big issues is that the arm that you guys saw there is it costs $100,000 to make, you know, like, uh, like millions of dollars were spent on building that thing. Um, and it breaks down all the time very easily. And it's... Um, has, has several other problems too. And it turns out there, there are over 10 million people with hand amputations um, across the entire world. 80% of them are in developing nations and less than 3% have access to affordable prosthetics. And so the most common prosthetic hand in the world is what you see on this man's right hand. And this is known as a, as a hook, right? So it's two steel pincers with a bicycle cable that connects to your shoulders. When you squeeze your shoulders together, this hook will open. When you relax your shoulders, this hook will close. So it's it's very low cost, um, but uh, it only opens and closes. You got to use your shoulders, which isn't necessarily the most intuitive way to control a prosthesis, um, and it can result in um, uh, shoulder injuries as well. And you know this is technology that hasn't changed since the Civil War era uh, of the United States, right? And then on this man's left hand is what's known as a myoelectric prosthesis. Myo meaning muscle and electric meaning, well, electric, right? And uh, this is controlled by using EMG sensors on his residual limb, and you can use that to open and close the hand. And then the next step up from that is what we call a multi-articulated hand, where individual fingers of the hand are uh, able to move. Now, as you get into those more sophisticated devices, they get super expensive, they're very fragile, they're very slow to move, they're, they're very heavy on the users. And on top of that, if you try to touch anything with that, you wouldn't actually feel any feedback from them um, at all. And so that's what we had set out to, uh, to change. And so we built um, uh, what we call the ability hand um, to make it super robust to impacts. It's the fastest um, hand in the world. Um, it's lighter than an average adult human hand. It's the first to give users touch feedback embedded in the prosthesis itself. Um, and we actually made it affordable. And we're gonna talk a, uh, about all of that stuff uh, in a little bit. And We've gone through actually nine different prototypes over the last seven years. The first five are shown here with the, the top two being uh, based off of open source designs um, that are available online. 
And um, it was in the summer of 2014, while I was a grad student at the University of Illinois, um, that we met this man. This is David Krupa, and he is also an alum from the University of Illinois. And he runs a nonprofit organization called the Range of Motion Project. And their whole mission is to provide prosthetics to those who can't afford them in developing nations. So the US, Guatemala, and Ecuador in particular. And in the summer of 2014, he was able to get the U.S. Embassy to fund me and another graduate student to go down to uh, Ecuador and actually try out the hand on a patient. And this is part of a much longer story of two weeks of all all-nighters trying to get this hand to work, which I'll, I'll tell at some other time. It's a, it's a fun one. Um, but in front of um, international news stations, um, we were barely able to get this hand to work for the first time on our patient. And... Um, uh, this next video shows one of the international news stations covering that the events of that day. Juan Trujillo es ex comandante de guerra. Fue así como perdió parte de su brazo. De esto ha pasado más de 30 años. Herida y en la parte la mía me cobró el brazo izquierdo. Gracias al avance de la tecnología, hoy puede acceder a una prótesis. Tenía. Con este ingenioso tipo. My hair was cooler then. Fue desarrollado en una prótesis de brazo bioeléctrico con la posibilidad de retroalimentación sensorial. Es decir, sentir como una mano de verdad. Okay, so a couple of things I want to point out here, right? The, the hand that you see on the screen right now, it's three times the size of an average adult human hand, right? It's 3D printed. It's got wires going everywhere, plugged into breadboards, plugged into power supplies, my laptop, and then the wall, right? Despite that, Juan said that he felt as though a part of him had come back. And that was because he made a pinch with his left hand for the first time in 35 years. In fact, he had forgotten how to make a pinch with his left hand. And we had to do mirror therapy where we put a mirror in front of his amputated side, reflecting his intact right hand, tricking his brain into thinking that his left hand was there. And then when he tried to make a pinch with both sides, it reactivated his muscles and it felt um, real to him, right? And so when he said that a part of him had come back, that's when I realized that if I go the traditional MD, PhD route, go to an academic hospital, then this just ends up as a journal paper. If we want everyone to feel the exact same way that Juan did, we had to commercialize the technology. And so that's when Psionic was born. And so we went back to the University of Illinois. We won our school's business plan competition. We won the Illinois Innovation Prize, several NSF grants, SBIR grants, um, raised a, a pre-seed round, and then we just started a seed round. Um, and in September of last year, um, we have released the Ability Hand nationwide. It is covered by, uh, it's FDA registered and it's covered by Medicare in the U.S. And this is, uh, this is what it looks like now. This is retired U.S. Army Sergeant Garrett Anderson doing push-ups for the first time since his Army days. Um, he's able to lift a 50-pound kettlebell uh, with ease. And uh, you can do all sorts of activities of daily living with the hand, something as simple as closing the lid of your laptop uh, or one of our uh, uh, first patients in Chicago, she was able to feed her granddaughter for the very first time because she was able to hold the bottle with her bionic hand and then hold her granddaughter uh, with her um, with her natural left arm. And it's just made a huge difference in the quality of life um, for our patients, right? I mean, they're able to function with one hand and do all of these tasks, uh, but by, by using a bionic hand, it makes their lives a lot easier and makes it uh, much more convenient. And um, so I've got the I've got the hand right over here, and this is kind of a breakdown of, of and you guys will get the chance to play with this um, uh, as much as you want, like right afterwards, right? So all five fingers flex and extend, and the thumb rotates as well. So there's six degrees of freedom, six motors in here. Um, so uh, uh, we can also, by flexing your muscles more lightly, you can control the speed of it. So you can do like, you know, smoother jazz fingers if you want. Um, and then uh, if you're on a two channel control system, then um, if you open twice, you can switch to different grips, right? So here's a key grip, for example, or if I want to give someone a thumbs up. I can just slide the thumb over and then you turn it into a power grip so you can shake people's hands with this. Um, we can do much more precision grips too. So I can like uh, pinch things, right? Um, so we brought some raspberries. So you'll get to see me like pinching some raspberries without crushing them um, later on. And then of course we have gestures that you can do with the hand too, right? So if you had a rock concert, you can rock on, right? Uh, so other things about this, the fingers are flexible. So they're uh, made of compliant joints. So I can smash this and it totally survives. 
Um, we just released a video this morning uh, on YouTube and all our social media of me climbing to the roof of my house, dropping it uh, 10 meters in the air and it's surviving. We put in a dryer for 10 minutes. We put a GoPro in there and you can see it just tumbling around. I stepped on it. Um, what else? Um, oh yeah, and then um, Sergeant Anderson well, was uh, breaking through ice blocks, Karate Kid 2 style, and we set some boards on fire and he he broke it that way too. Um, so uh, other things, it's uh, this is actual carbon fiber on the hand, so it's super light and super strong. It weighs less than an average adult human hand. So this is 490 grams. Average adult human hand is 520 grams. Um, it's water resistant up to the wrist, so you can wash it as you would a natural hand. Um, it's got Bluetooth on it, and so there's an app for it, So because there's an app for everything these days, right? Um, so you can do software updates over the air um, through the app. And um, you, we have actually got some Easter eggs on it too, where you can actually play music through the uh, the motors as well. So any 8-bit song um, that you want, we can actually emulate it on the, the hand itself. Um, it's USB-C rechargeable. So the same way you plug in your phone, you can plug in your arm. Um, it'll recharge from zero to 100% in 60 minutes. Um, it'll last about eight to 10 hours a day. Um, so if you're out in the woods, you can have a portable power pack and then charge it that way. And then um, you can also charge your phone from your arm as well. So it's another superhuman ability um, that we like to give our users. Um, but the best part about all of that is, is that we actually got it at a price point that Medicare in the US would cover, right? And to put that in perspective, before our hand really came along, a, a multi-articulated hand like this would only be covered by about 10% of the market, which was if you were in the military or if you had a workplace accident. Um, so by getting it covered under Medicare, we were actually able to expand that access to 75% of US patients can now afford the most advanced bionic hand on the market. And that's what we were all about. We wanted to make the most advanced hand and make it more accessible um, than ever. So we've got a bunch of fun videos. This is um, uh, Dan St. Pierre, three minutes after he was first fit with the device, someone threw him a water bottle and he was able to catch it. So our hand is uh, closes in 200 milliseconds, which is technically faster than we can blink our own eyes, which uh, we found um, is 300 milliseconds. Um, and it's uh, two and a half times faster than any of the other prosthetics on the market. So in terms of robustness, this next video you'll see on the right side is a traditional uh, pin joint four bar linkage uh, mechanism for the fingers. And on the left side is our compliant finger design. And we put it in uh, an impact uh, tester and we have this giant hammer coming down with a piston. And on the right, you see that the pin joint just entirely breaks off while on the left, the finger just returns back to its natural position as though nothing actually hit it, right? Um, I've uh, arm wrestled against the paratriathlete national champion and I lost. Um, so I, I got to start uh, working out a bit more. This was in the State Farm Center arena where the fighting Illini played. They they gave us the, it to, so I could uh, do this arm wrestling match. And yeah, I, I, I'll save you the embarrassment of me, of me losing. Um, I, but if you guys remember the um, that trend of bottle flip tricks um, where you have a partially filled bottle of water, you can imagine, and you try to flip it and make it land. You can imagine that that's a lot harder Harder to do with a bionic hand, right? But because of our compliant fingers and the and the touch feedback, one of our uh, one of our users, Kate Kettlehone, she's a 17 year old um, uh, pre med student. Well, now she's 18 uh, at Johns Hopkins. She came to our lab and was just nailing these shots all over the place. And this is one of our favorites, where she was able to flip it up two stories up on the windowsill with the bionic hand. Um, and we, we have a lot of fun uh, with this stuff. And so this Halloween, just two weeks ago, um, we uh, made the hand um, crawl from the ceiling and then walk on its own, um, Adam's family style. Um, and uh, we, we just had like an army of these uh, going and, uh, and they, they webbed me up. So, uh, uh, and then um, the the video is telling you about that we just released today. So this is Sergeant Anderson, and and for Veterans Day, I suppose this is appropriate. Um, this is him uh, breaking through three boards on fire um, with the hand. And so, if you guys remember the the video I showed you of Juan, right, uh, back in Ecuador in 2014. Um, we went back down in 2018, and of course, the first thing he wants to do with the bionic hand is drive his car, right? And that's fine, but to make matters worse, um, 
it's stick shift. So his um, his natural right hand has to stay on the gear shifter while his bionic hand has to stay on the steering wheel. And on top of that, um, it's manual. Uh, there's uh, there's not, not power, there's not any power steering in it either, right? So he has to have a firm grip on this thing. And so my, my director of engineering, who's here with me, Jesse and I, we were in um, in the car, and like my heart was racing the entire time because we were in downtown Quito, and he's driving with our bionic hand. If something goes wrong, uh, it could go really wrong. But he was able to do this without any issues at all. And he can even like change the blinkers with it, which I think he'll show in just a second. And then he's able to get back into traffic like it was no big deal at all that he was just doing this with a bionic hand, right? He can even use his other hand then to like gesture at the other um, the, the other cars too, right? Um, okay, and so, all of those functions that, that you saw in these videos, they're all the highlighting the motor control, right? And so um, one of the things that makes our hand unique is how we embed the, the, the touch um, feedback through um, the hand itself, right? So we've got six uh, pressure sensors that we have in the uh, uh, on the finger itself. So one on the fingertip, one on the finger pad, one on the, or two on the lateral aspect of the distal phalanx, and then two on the medial aspect of the distal phalanx. So that's six total. We can put them in all six, uh, all, all of the fingers. So that's 30. Um, touch sensors total. And then um, right now, clinically, we deliver it through a single vibration motor. So if you touch here, then you'll feel a vibration for a second. And when you let go, you'll feel another vibration again. However, um, we've also been doing other types of modalities like um, uh, electrotactile stimulation. And so a lot of my research during my PhD was on electrotactile stimulation, where you can send a bit of current across the skin and then make it feel like different things. The hard part is to make that feeling consistent over time, especially when you're moving around and sweating and, and all sorts of skin conditions. Uh, so, but that being said, um, this next video shows the first time ever that we hooked Juan up to the device and um, how quickly he was able to um, detect the different um, pressures that I was applying on the fingertip. So now we're going to try and tell you that whether it's a light touch or a strong touch. I even tried to fake him out there. But he still said that it was a, a strong um, sensation. And so he, he was able to get this again immediately on the very first try that that he was ever um, hooked up to this device, right? So that kind of feedback is is really helpful for our patients to do functional tasks. And one of the things that we we implement too is something that we call a contact reflex. And so um, this was used a lot by um, uh, Jerry Loeb and, and uh, Jeremy Fischel out in uh, USC when they were uh, before they created Syntouch. And um, with the contact reflex, what uh, what we can do is, as soon as the uh, touch sensors detect a a, um, a stimulus over a certain threshold, we can automatically slow down the motors or stop them entirely and give you much finer control over the object. So you can do very fine control of delicate objects. And so this is 80-year-old triple amputee EQ Sylvester grasping a hollow eggshell without cracking it on his first try while blindfolded because of the contact reflexes and the and the um, haptic feedback that he was receiving. And of course, you know, we, we're scientists, so we, we actually test this, how many eggshells did you end up crushing, and as well as how many water cups did you end up crushing. And then we found that, um, we found a statistically significant difference between um, when you were, uh, when you received the feedback versus when you didn't receive the feedback, even if you could see what you were doing. Um, so that was uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty useful for our subjects. And so we can deliver, uh, deliver this uh, sensation of the users with multiple um, types of um, 
you know, uh, electronics that we can place on the surface of the skin. And uh, a lot of the things we're getting into is more on the invasive side too, with um, implanted electrodes as well. Uh, but on the surface, we've uh, collaborated with John Rogers, and then we've made epidermal electronic devices that can do both EMG sensing and um, electrical stimulation simultaneously, um, as well as like thermal sensing and, um, and uh, a strain gauge on there as well. And then we can put them in much larger arrays that can go around like your forearm and different parts of your body. And then um, uh, most recently, Recently, we developed a um, wireless haptic device that was an array of vibrotactile motors that could be wirelessly powered that you could slap anywhere on your body and then um, deliver this uh, feedback to users. And um, actually, um, to, the, to the point uh, of uh, that was made in one of, uh, in the last talk as well. So we have uh, a lot of our patients have targeted reinnervation. It's become a standard of care um, now for most patients for phantom limb pain. Um, but a uh, an artifact of that a lot of times is um, getting targeted sensory reinnervation, where on your residual limb you can uh, feel different parts of of your hand. And so we have uh, one of our patients who has this. In this next video, you'll see. Um, when I'm touching the finger um, on the hand that um, our patient is actually able to feel each individual finger uh, on his residual limb um, with just the vibration motor. And we could use a vibration uh, array like this in order to um, get access to each one of those individual fingers. So, when you have vibration here, so you have different parts on his arm that feel different parts. So, and he's able to get that isolate every single one so the middle finger the the index finger and the thumb as well and this is uh, possible to do with our api so our api allows us to stream all 30 touch sensors individually. And so we can target each one. We can stream all the encoder data. So we have the position feedback and we can do position torque and velocity control over all six of the motors. And so because of that, a lot of roboticists have been um, uh, interested in purchasing our hand too for humanoid robots. And so this is Aptronic um, using our hand on their humanoid robot system and they're able to um, control uh, all the grips. Uh, but even in, in addition to humanoid uh, robots, you can use this on robot dogs uh, as well. So this is the Boston Dynamics Spot um, dog. Uh, and we put arms on him with, with hands and gave him lightsabers. Uh, and so um, I actually had a lightsaber duel against the Boston Dynamics dog um, in General Grievous mode, if you guys are Star Wars uh, fans. I keep losing these challenges. Like someday I will get good at this. <laughs> and so this was with um, Kim Lab at the University of Illinois, Ju Hyung Kim's group um, that has um, uh, the Boston Dynamics dog and built the arms that our hands are attached to um, as well. And so um, with that, you, you might've seen that um, we're actually in the middle of an equity crowdfunding round right now. And this is something we'll, we'll probably touch on uh, a bit more in the entrepreneurship investment panel. And um, if you guys are actually interested in investing, you, you guys can do it for as little as $250. We're hoping to get 20 more people on board by the end of next week. And um, you know the thing is, this is a pretty unique opportunity in the sense that a lot of times, especially in our field, like faculty members and students don't get to be a part of, uh, of a lot of these types of companies that are being built. And so uh, this is like, you know, uh, we want to extend this. We want to make the company accessible to everyone as well, in addition to just uh, our prosthetic hands too. So please join us in our bionic revolution. And so while, while you guys are doing that, I want to finish with um, uh, a demo that you guys will get to try out yourself. And this one uh, is on my cell phone. And so we just moved to San Diego a couple months ago, and our goal is to turn it into the bionics capital of the world, right? We are uh, collaborating with the military hospital to do uh, bone integration of the these prosthetics. So instead of just wearing it on a socket, it'll be directly attached to your bones, as well as implanted electrodes. And uh, one of the things that we want to enable with these implanted electrodes is direct position control and, and then uh, sensory feedback of the hand. And so um, I've got um, I've got this demo right here. And Gert, I'm going to come over to you, actually. And if you want to just put your hand in the camera on my phone. 
my hand? Yeah, yeah, just put your hand in the camera. It'll actually, oh, okay. yes, and then move your, like close your fingers, yep. And then you can actually in real time control the position of all the fingers that are on this hand, right? And this is using, oh yeah, yeah. So that way they can see it on the Zoom call. Um, so yeah, so, so Gert is opening and closing all the fingers on his hand and in real time, the, the hand is responding um, to the individual uh, fingers moving. <laughs> And you guys will get to try uh, this demo out too. And we've actually bought multiple hands. So um, uh, our director of engineering last week just programmed it so you can do two hands at the same time. So it'll be a lot of fun um, to, to try out. So um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys have. Questions? I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the control of the hand. Is it is it through the EMG sensors primarily, or are there other methods of doing it? And um, a little bit about the algorithms that you've been using to decode. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the, uh, with respect to the algorithms, we're actually agnostic to whatever the control system is, right? So for example, you just saw Gert doing it through my webcam on my phone, right? Um, traditionally, we um, most of our patients have like um, two-site EMG control, like dual-site EMG control, and that's what these buttons are doing, right? So when I do close and open, right, I can open it twice and then switch to the different grip, right? It's compatible with coax, so you can use pattern recognition algorithms for eight channels of EMG. Um, we've got uh, collaborators doing implanted electrodes with through the API and also brain implants through um, the API as well. So for us, we're agnostic to the, the control system in itself. Now that being said, with the um, with the peripheral nerve implants, what we're what we're um, going to be uh, working towards is using TensorFlow, which is the same algorithm that the hand tracking on our phone is using, but instead of using the, uh, the webcam data, we can feed in neural data instead. So we'll see how, how it's going to go. That's going to be over the next six months that we're going to be trying this um, and, and seeing how well it works. Uh, I, uh, I got a question. Thank you very much. Very interesting and fun and inspiring talk. Um, you, you started out with you wanted to pro be able to provide those prosthetics to a much, much, much larger crowd than it was able before. And, and now you're talking about potentially using implanted electrodes, either brain computer interface or going directly into the link. But that, of course, is a, it's a very different. Gain there, and uh, I'm not sure you can take that to developing countries or so. So, so what is the the plan there? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. So um, that's one of the, that was one of our design philosophies as well, is that we wanted to make sure that our hand that we built was um, was usable for clinically available systems now, as well as those ones that are going to be available in the future as well, right? So the same hand, when the brain implants and, and uh, comes out, it's it's literally just the exact same software that's in here, right? Um, that they can use to, to control it, right? So even if you have a control system that's not a brain implant in a place like India or Pakistan or Ecuador, or, or Guatemala, the hand will still work until they can. We can get those to the point where it's it's uh, not cost prohibitive in those uh, regions in particular. Uh, so that that's definitely one of the cases. Now, um, in terms of like funding that kind of stuff too, right? The the robotics market is arguably even bigger um, than than like the the prosthetics market in, in particular, right? So if we're best producing these on a large enough scale, then we can subsidize the cost of of things like uh, the implanted electrodes in developing nations as well. So uh, we have a nonprofit. Uh, sorry, we have a subsidiary of the company that works with nonprofits called the Psionic Institute, whose mission is to accept donations to subsidize those costs in developing nations, so that they can get um, the surgeries and and, um, and and devices like this as well. So that's all part of the the plan. Well, great uh, presentation. Just a couple of questions. Um, first is, <laughs> okay, I have to be one question. Um, <laughs> The proprioception, right? It's it got from like uh, thickness of the muscles. So, but I also saw that they were using EEG for like the tactile sensing. So I, I, I want to be uh, I, I want to be sure actually what are you using that for? Is it for the tactile, or since are using that uh, mm, that's just getting the signals from the muscles? So are, are we saying that that is more like uh, efficient than just getting the signals from that EEG? Then also, can it also capture on um, reflexes? Like, if the patient isn't actively focusing on doing the activity, 
and the capital reflexes also. I'm talking about the arm right now. Um, okay, so the the first part of that question. Um, so we don't use EEG uh, at all. Um, it's I guess the the sensors that that you're referring to. I think uh, like these ones, they can be used. For EEG, I guess if we place them on the scalp. Um, but for our context and purposes, we only use um, EMG uh, in particular. Uh, and so this device in particular has both the electrotactile stimulators, or like electrodes, as well as the EMG electrode on, on, a, uh, on the same device, right? The electrotactile stimulators provide the haptic feedback. So when you touch here, then they'll feel the, the sensation. And then the EMG will uh, produce the, the motor um, uh, input into the hand um, itself. Now, in terms of capturing reflexes from, um, from the residual limb, um, uh, I mean, I guess as long as there's a signal that's large enough from the muscle to be captured by EMG from the reflex, then uh, the, the hand will respond um, in that context. But it all depends on what your residual musculature is uh, uh, in that. Um, <laughs> I guess we got more questions. So, could the demo presenters already from the state in their room? And so, we can have a few more questions, uh, short questions. <laughs> I'll make my question <laughs> Beautiful work. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the human hand, do you, can you give me a rough estimate of the number of sensors and transducers that are available in, in, in the nature as opposed to your device right now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it would probably be something around like 20,000, uh, like or, or more. Yeah, in like a natural human hand, right? I mean, we have 30, right? <laughs> 30 touch sensors in particular. And, and even with the degrees of freedom, right? A, a natural hand has like um, 23 degrees of freedom, right? And are, are we reduce that down to six, right? And so the thing is, is that with the control systems that are available now, um, we've boiled it down to what the most important functions are. And 80% of the, the grips that we do on a daily basis are a power grip and a key grip. And most of the the tactile feelings that we get are, are from the fingertips for like gross motor task or, or gross sensory task, I guess, in this case. Um, so as the, as the, um, uh, the control systems and the um, interface back to the human gets better, then we're going to keep improving on the hand to give those things. So for example, we, we'd put temperature sensors built into the hand so that we could give um, thermal feedback to users. Um, or uh, when we get better motor control, then we can like do abduction, adduction in the fingers and then like a spherical wrist as well. Um, but once uh, the control systems and the, the, the interface to the human need to catch up in some regard. And that's why I was saying we built the hand to be available or to work with clinically available systems now, as well as the ones that come out in the future. <laughs> do we have a line here for the demo? Have... So where are all the demo presenters? <clears throat> okay, okay, very good. So please sign up. <laughs> one, one more question. <laughs> sure. I can ask like this. I think everybody can hear me. Um yeah, so really cool presentation. And um this question is may maybe not uh, to take too seriously. So you can uh, control individual fingers, right? Yes. Have you considered adding extra fingers? <laughs> and if you have considered it, why did you decide against it? So um, uh, there, the, I'm sure you're familiar with the Uncanny Valley, right? Um, so there, you know, a lot of times um, there might be even better grippers than like a, a human hand, an anthropomorphic hand, for especially for doing specific tasks, right? I mean, that's why you'll see in a lot of manufacturing tasks on industrial robots, they've got like parallel jaw grippers or like uh, three prong grippers, right, instead. Um, but there's a level of anthropomorphism that like a human hand looking like that, that is acceptable by people. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a, it, it's, um, there's a niche area in particular, right? If you make it look too human-like, then then um, it looks just weird and 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 scary, right? But if you make it look bionic like this, then it's like then everyone thinks it's really cool. And for our users, that gives them the confidence and the power to know that, like you know, this isn't something to be ashamed of, like especially if you're a war hero, right? I mean, this is this is something to be celebrated, right? Um, so because of that, we we stuck to you know five digits in in particular, as opposed to doing supernumerary um, things. Yeah, I, I just wonder because I once saw a talk uh, from a guy and he was interested in investigating brain activity in people that have additional fingers and actually found that the motor and somatosensory cortex has uh, yeah, additional areas for those fingers 
And I wondered if uh, something like that would happen in these uh, people then, if they actually can control additional fingers through uh, combinations of muscles in their arms or something. Yeah. So but that's the first more scientific question. <laughs> Was thanks, uh, uh, Julian. Thank you. Uh, don't be involved. Okay, so now that's another. Uh, you're on the line, actually. You're the first. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm the first one. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, we're we're now entering another exciting phase of this workshop. So these are our demonstration. Spotlights, um, and we said two minutes each. Uh, uh, and immediately afterwards, we'll have some demonstrations just across the building here uh, in the Moby uh, lab. Right? So, doors open. So, please, uh, during lunch, uh, uh, enjoy the uh, great demonstration that we have there today. Okay. You want to do this bit now? <laughs> With the raspberries? Yeah, yeah. Well, might as well show it, right? I mean, because we've seen the most of the demonstrations already, except the the two hand control, which we'll get our laptop okay. set up for it that. But, yes, I'll, yes. I'll I'll try. Yeah, that's yours now. Yes. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then, uh, is, does this video play, um, or is it is it just a still of the? It uh, may be still. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. that's that's fine. I mean, you you guys saw great control in the hand. You guys were all get a chance to do that, right? And so this is um, I, I'll I'll demonstrate picking up a raspberry. Um, without uh, squishing it, yes, there we go. Right, uh, because of the, the you know the haptic feedback, and then we can um, control like the, the the motors as well and the compliant grip. So, uh, oh yeah, here here here's the raspberry that I gripped <laughs> with the uh, with the hand uh, for for everyone on Zoom. But um, yeah, please uh, come out, try it out. You can shake hands with the bionic hand, and then um, get a chance to control all of them too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So now we have um, Ying. Yes. Yeah. From the podium. Oh. Yeah. Oh, hello, my name is Ying Wu. I'm happy to be here today at this. Uh, Wonderful event. I'm here to tell you about or do a demo from our emerging project called the Coevolution of Human AI Teaming. So this project I'm leading um, in collaboration with Xi Ping Zhong here at um, IMC, and also with Christopher McClellan at Georgia Institute of Technology and Alessandro Roncone at uh, CU Boulder. And this project is funded by the Army Research Laboratory. So it centers on the question of um, the coevolution of human AI teaming or human AI adaption, adaptation. So in um, most settings today where there's human in the loop training um, an agent in some kind of machine learning paradigm, usually they're training on a fixed and known reward function. But we know that in the real world, you know, that doesn't always work. You know, goals change, um, contingencies change, um, constraints change. And so we want to understand how we can develop a team that can adapt flexibly to new contingencies in a mission. So our first stage of this is basically developing like a human AI teaming paradigm, which you can see um, on the left. And that is a virtual reality based paradigm of a logistics game that we've entitled Space Transit that involves um moving trains from station to station and building lines from stations that are like cubes or spheres or cones and then there's passengers at all these stations so that's the little black triangles or circles and so basically you have to build a line so that the trains can efficiently get their passengers to the different stations so that's the game i'll be demoing today you're welcome to come try it out um we are, are, you know, what we're working on now is trying to train an agent to play this game. It is now playable by a human, but we want to develop an interactive task learning agent that can learn from either demonstrations or from language um, how to play the game. And we're hoping that these, like these things, these activities down the red, these actions like connect the station to a segment, are the things the human will demonstrate. But we're hoping that the human, through language and other means, can 
provide enough information for the system to learn some of this like higher order structure. So if the goal is to say get all the triangle passengers from a station, you know, there's these uh, methods or the green boxes. And what we're what we're trying to develop is a system that can actually learn some of these other parts from the human demonstration. So I Thank hope you. to see you later on today. Okay, for this one. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jian from UC San Diego, and I work with In and TP on this project called uh, Freely Moving Gate Related EEG uh, Immobile Virtual Environment. And why we are interested in putting the experiment into VR is because previously we always asked the subject to sit in front of the computer and then try to keep their head still and detect the brain signal. But that's not uh, how we want to use the brain computer interface in the real world. So the first day we tried to investigate how to implement BCI, uh, brain computer interface into the real world is putting into VR. And now we let the subject move their head freely, but we need to have some benchmarks. So uh, the EEG signal we try to detect is from the visual all ball and which generate the P300 we all know uh, on the CD channel. And we try to see if we can reconstruct this signal while the, uh, while the subject is moving their head uh, inside this VR environment. So um, as you can see, there are two conditions. One, we ask them to move their eyes only to track the target. The other that they can actually turn their head to point toward the target. And in the middle, we see the um, action. We have three conditions. Uh, we pan out to three event related potential. One is stimulus onset, where traditionally we time lock to. And the next one, we have a gaze intersect point onset, is meaning that where their eye gaze overlap with the object. And finally, we have the fixation onset, which means that their eye and head uh, are all still. And then we try to reconstruct the EEG signal and see if we can detect P300. Um, more detail will be in the demo uh, later. Thank you so much. OK, so Min. Hello, my name is Min, and I am in uh, Good Converse Lab. I'm a student at PhD. Um, so I just want to give a quick starters of like the motivation of our work is to create a versatile wireless electrophysiology in-ear uh, biosensing system for continuous brain and health monitoring. So to go more in depth of the motivation of this work, we want to build this continuous body sensor network. And this continuous body sensor network is to have a device that you could connect and stream synchronously through various different um, locations of the body. And this is very helpful for BCI applications, multimodal health monitoring, and subject-to-subject -subject comparison. So we have to decide what uh, location would be ideal for this um, multimodal sensing. And we concluded that it would be best in the in-ear location, because in-ear, you could get a lot of signals, um, EEG, EOG, um, EMG and ECG, um, along with um, chemical sensing, such as EDA, lactate, and sodium sensing. So in our work, we actually um, developed a system that we could do just that. We have a subject here with our system of the wireless um, um, electrophysiology data acquisition board, along with an in-ear simple generic um, uh, earpiece, along with um, electrodes surrounding the face. And we were able to get the proliferative uh, data, such as eye blinks here, EMG, um, EOG eye rotations, and also alpha, which is EEG as well. And now going more towards the depths of our, our, our wearable wear, our versatile system, we have more details about our earpiece itself. Um, it's a one planar PCB that you could assemble into a 3D structure. And this is really great if you are going to do this at uh, your own home or if it's your school project, you could design, you could just have it to the manufacturer, print it out, and then assemble it at your own home. And then we also have the our wireless data acquisition board. Now, this is really nice because it has a high sampling rate, uh, sampling frequency up to four kilohertz, 
a small package of 16 channels um, with an accelerometer and a local SD card storage uh, for offline use, but is also capable of wirelessly streaming the data to a single router. And this router could also, you just need one computer to talk to this router and have all these different um, VDAC systems to stream synchronously to a live streaming layer, which you could um, record at once. So this will, this work is also going to be all open source so that the people in the BCI community and other communities for health monitoring can, can have access and play around with this. So please come to our demo. Okay, well, next we have, um, well, Tatiana Kassem, and um, I'm not sure whether uh, she, well, she's still traveling, uh, there has been some flight delays, and, and uh, actually coming all the way from uh, Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, I'm not sure, so Tatiana, if, uh, you may not be there um, over Zoom. I think she's now probably boarding the plane, so it wouldn't work. But hopefully we'll, uh, she'll be here in time for the demonstration is uh, later uh, in the afternoon. So please stop by and see her work. She's, she went all the way from the road. She came, she's, she's almost here. Um, okay, so it's, and I can present for her. She, she actually brings a, uh, a system and, and she told me it's working and she, she'll bring it over here. A continuous neurotransmitter monitoring system. So, so for observing, um, well, correlating what you can observe from uh, uh, neurotransmitter measurements in a very invasive technique, uh, then with uh, EEG measurements and then using those correlations to now substituting that for doing a, uh, a neurotransmitter uh, monitoring system purely from the EEG. Uh, of course, she didn't, she'll bring here uh, just the, um, the, the EEG based system, but uh, she'll be demonstrating that uh, up here. And so that's it. So we'll, we'll look forward to that one. Uh, the last, uh, our last demo for today is uh, Jaja. So you can come back here. Uh, hi, so uh, hi, my name is Jia Jia Wu. I'm a PhD student from UC San Diego, UC department, and I'm working with Professor Greg Collins and Professor Patrick Mercier. Um, today, my demonstration is a neural interface design. So this is a sitting channel, um, row noise, and uh, wide band neural recording system on chip, and uh, it was fabricated in TSMC 65 nanometer process. Um, so the size of it is only one millimeter by one millimeter, um, but it covers a very wide frequency range from from one millihertz to one kilohertz bandwidth. So uh, each channel consists of a data sigma analog to digital converter, and the core circuits include a current reuse OTA, a strom arm dynamic comparator, and we also use choppy and uh, uh, correlated double sampling techniques in the system. So all these circuit design enable um, this system uh, capable of operating in two modes. One mode is a uh, continuous mode, which has a like, constant power supply. Uh, another mode we call it a sample level DT cycling mode. In this uh, mode, we can DT cycle our power supply so that we can significantly, uh, significantly scale down the power consumption um, when we record the low frequency by potentials. So um, in the continuous mode, we it achieves like one microvolt RMS input for noise over one hertz to one kilohertz bandwidth with a noise efficiency factor of 2.9. And uh, in the sample level to recycling mode, um, it maintains reasonable noise level uh, with a uh, down to one millihertz, and the, it has an input impedance of more than 400 mega ohms. Um, so, uh, and the total power consumption of per channel is only 0 0.09 microwatt. Um, we also did like in vivo measurements to validate the system. So EEG uh, recordings were performed on a human subject. The chip interface is three electrodes mounted on the forehead. And uh, um, so we measured the alpha uh, EEG modulation and the auditory um, steady state response at the same time. Uh, from this power spectrum, uh, we can clearly see the uh, alpha EEG and the 40 Hertz ASSR peak. So um, this system is quite useful, uh, suitable for the chronic use in like um, 
uh, I think, mobile healthcare settings. So uh, let's discuss more about it when you stop by my demonstration and I will show you how it works. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's great. So now we're, um, it's lunchtime, so get your food and, and then please uh, stop by the demonstrations because students all work hard to get it already. I return here.